Okay. Um, might be a few stragglers coming in in a minute, but uh, bang on 12, so let's get started. I hope you're all here for the right lecture. I recognise most of you, I think. So uh, uh, we're all here for the, the next lecture in EM radiation. So we found our two slots. Uh, does anyone happen to know who that is in the picture? Don't worry if you don't. It, this is uh, Julian Schwinger. And Julian Schwinger got a Nobel Prize for elucidating some of the stuff that we, we're going to be talking about later on in the course. Okay? And we're going we're to copy his style. Okay, he's, one of the quotes attributed to him, or about him, was, his laboratory is his ballpoint pen. Right? So like I said, this is going to be a pen-based course. Okay? Um, and with a cup of coffee and a pen, we can hopefully uh, find out some interesting things about the electromagnetic field. Okay? So hopefully you can see that text that I've written there. I hope it's large enough. Should you shout out if it's not? Uh, I do check in each lecture theatre. And where we're going eventually, this is one of his pivotal papers, you can look it up, I'm going to put it onto the Blackboard site later, on the classical radiation of accelerated electrons. Hello. Sorry, uh, is there one called, because I was literally, but no one else is Yeah, I looked around for the air con in this room. Uh, oh yeah, I can shut that for sure. Yeah, shut that. How's that? Well, it should warm up in a bit. But there's some weird air con up there, I thought it was that. Okay. Um, Okay, so we're eventually going to get to looking at synchrotron radiation, which is one of Julian Schwinger's great contributions to physics. We'll get there in section six, and we're going to eventually derive that formula there. Okay, except you, this is in CGS, as I mentioned last time. This will be uh, this, this. This is a different form to the form you will see it written in SI units. Okay, but that's Larmor's formula, and you can see power proportional to acceleration squared. Okay, that's where we're headed. Now. Today, we're going to start looking at the properties of the electromagnetic field, some of those things you are familiar with. So we're going to begin by reminding ourselves of some of the things that you have already found a second year. Okay? So hopefully if you miss anything as we go through, I'm going to go at a fairly brisk pace. There is a lot of text in the written up notes that you can use to refer to, and if you have any specific questions, please come and have a chat to me. Like I said, I'm in the nuclear lab on Fridays on the second floor. Okay, now, we remarked in the last lecture that charge makes field. And that's essentially what Gauss's law is telling us. Okay? The divergence of the electric field at any given point is proportional to the charge density at that point. That's what Gauss's law says. Okay? They're really equivalent statements, aren't they? But we can say, therefore, that charges are sources of electric field. So if I were to draw, for example, a positive charge, I can draw these field lines, and of course we remark that field lines aren't really real, but they're a convenient way to describe the field density around a charge. Okay? That's a positive charge and a negative charge. Label a little plus there. I can label a negative charge in a like manner, and of course the field lines go towards it. Now that's a very important statement when you think about it because that tells you if there is any creation of an electric field line at some point or a discontinuity in the field line, you know, if there's an addition of field lines, there has to be a charge density there. That's an important statement to, 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 to remember. Okay? And the other thing we can say, as we again we remarked upon last time, if I count up the field lines passing through some surface of course, this is, this is Gauss's law, stated in its integral form. I can draw, for example, two surfaces around some charge. Right? I'm going to label them 1 and 2, clearly at different radii. And if I count up the field lines passing through those two surfaces, it must be the to same total number. Okay? In other words, if I integrate the electric field around any closed surface, then that must be, because the number of field lines is proportional to the charge, it must be equal to the total amount of charge contained within the volume. That's what the right-hand integral is telling us. Okay? I'll zoom in a little. Okay. And of course, from that statement, if I have a spherically symmetric... Sorry, if I have a, a point charge which gives rise to a spherically symmetric electric field, it's 
this statement here that tells me that the electric field must fall inversely with the square of the distance. It arises directly from that, as I'm sure you can derive. Now there is an equivalent statement about magnetic fields that you already know, which is there are no magnetic charges. So therefore, the divergence of the magnetic field is zero. Okay? And that's, that's known in various forms. It doesn't really seem to have a proper name, does it? It's called the no, you can call it the no magnetic monopoles law, if you like. Okay? And therefore, if I have some, again, some arbitrarily drawn surface around a volume, and I look at the field lines going in and out of it, okay, the number of field lines passing into the surface, when integrated in that appropriate way by taking the normal to the surface, must be equal to the number of field lines exiting the surface, such that the integral over that surface of b dot ds equals zero. Okay, that's, this is correct. Therefore, I can have no situation such as this, where there are more field lines exiting, so you see I've drawn two field lines as before, above and below, and I have, rather than one going in and one coming out, I've now here got two coming out, that situation cannot arise. Okay, so I'll put a big X there, say, not allowed. Okay. So those are two of Maxwell's equations. And just to remind ourselves, here is Maxwell. I wrote his first scientific paper at the age of 14. That was, puts all of us to shame, doesn't it? And there we are. And he's a professor at 25. Yeah, well, there we go. I tried doing that today. Um, yeah. First, other, first ever colour photograph, actually. Fascinating person. Um, don't know if it was easier to do things, or it's just back then, or it's very bright. But anyway, so that's who we're talking about and his equations. And we'll see how he links to Julian Schwinger a bit later. But it's all part of the same overall idea. Okay, now, the other two of Maxwell's equations, again, you've seen it before, but let's just remind ourselves, we have Faraday's law, okay, and the thing I want to point out about Faraday's law, okay, Faraday's law, the important thing is that minus sign, okay, you will notice that it appears only once in the four Maxwell equations, there is some choice you can make about where you might put it. It's conventionally placed in Faraday's law, and that, in a sense, defines the directions of fields and the sense of them. And we call it lenses. You can call it an, an, a, a, an expression of lenses law, right? Which is to say that the induced fields always act as if to oppose any change which is made because otherwise you would not satisfy conservation of energy. That's why that minus sign is in there. Okay? But it also should be read as being a right-to-left law. Okay? That a change in magnetic flux gives rise to an electromotive force. Okay? So there is a sense in which that equation should be applied. Right? And similarly, I know I'm going at a brisk pace, but this is all written up in the notes. Okay? Similarly, you can make a statement about the magnetic field. But here there's something different, of course. Because for a magnetic field, we have Ampere's law. And this is not the same as what we saw just now for the electric field. This is saying that a steady current, a motion of charges, can give rise to a magnetic field. So there are electric charges which, when in motion, which is what that J represents, gives rise to a magnetic field. And you can see that, it, that the motion of the charge in any particular direction gives rise to a magnetic field which is transverse to it in some sense. And we all know, of course, it spirals around any current. But we're going to think about three-dimensional current distributions and we're going to try to relate the current in any direction to the magnetic field in that direction. And there's a, there's a slightly easier way to do it than, than what, what's, what's shown in Ampere's law. And the reason why we don't have such a statement in Faraday's law, of course, is there are no such things as magnetic charges. There can be no such thing as magnetic currents. So at first glance, these equations look quite different, don't they? But as you are already aware, so this is the classical Ampere's law. But we can add on the extra term, mu zero, epsilon zero, the e by dt, 
which is if there is a change in the electric field, then that also can induce a magnetic field. Okay? And again, this should be read as a right-to-left law. Right? The things which are acting on the right and the, and the, and the consequences are on the left. Okay? So clearly that's Anakin's law. And now we see a better symmetry because we recognize that the only thing that's really missing is the missing term in Faraday's law, which isn't there because there are no magnetic charges. Okay. <clears throat> now, so far, we've talked about charge density and the integration of charges, but we can equally well talk about things in terms of discrete charges. And of course, we know that in the real world, most charges are discrete, but we can treat them as charge densities most of the time. So we just remind ourselves about our symbols that rho is the electric charge density. There is no other kind. Okay. And we will always describe it here in terms of all the charges. Okay. All charges. And that's in coulombs per meter cubed. And we can relate that to the electric field in two ways, depending on how we think of the charges. We can either, so we can find the total electric field, give that, uh, that is produced by some charge density. We can take, we have this appropriate scaling value. We can integrate the charge density over some volume. So we count up all the charges within a volume, and we count up all the electric field lines. We've seen that many times. But we can equivalently do it in terms of discrete charges. We can count up all the charges I, Okay. Do the appropriate scaling. Of course, that scaling is, is merely really telling us how it's, it's a way of relating. It's just unit choice, isn't it? Really, we can we can count up certain amounts of charge and we relate that to the amount of electric field. Okay, and if the charges are in motion, then we have a current density, which is now a three-dimensional quantity. Okay, and that's going to include all currents. And again, that's in amps per meter squared okay, in any given direction. And we will conventionally define the electric field. This is in SI units, of course. So all of this is in SI. And remember that in CGS units, the formulae and the units are all different, and be careful. So here's the electric field, obviously in volts per meter. I think it's Highly advantageous if you use that way of describing it rather than the other way. Okay. And B is the magnetic field. Okay. But of course, we'll also come across this thing called H. And you will see B and H described in various textbooks in slightly different forms. Here, we're going to just think of B as being the magnetic field, which just happens to be present and gives rise to an, to, to an action. That you, when you're talking about certain magnetic, like practical magnetic systems, You'll think about H, the, 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 uh, the, um, the magnetic induction that's driving the magnetic field, and B, the resultant magnetic intensity. So you will see those terms also, also uh, put forward. Okay, and we're just going to call it the magnetic field because that's what everyone, everyone does. Okay. All right. So far, you've seen all that stuff before, right? And so most of this lecture, this will be quite familiar. Okay. Now, let's do a derivation. We're going to talk about charge conservation first. So another fact we know about the objects which make up the electromagnetic field which create them is that charges are conserved. Okay. So charge, or electric charge, okay, is neither created nor destroyed. Am I going at a decent pace, by the way? Is that all right? Yeah, you can kind of get the sketch of it. Remember that detailed notes are online, so if you get the diagrams down and follow along, then I find that writing down the main equations is usually the best way to commit it to memory as you go. Okay, okay so electric charge is neither created nor destroyed. So if charges are moving and I draw some volume, then I have to count the charges going in and out so I can relate the current to the charge change. So let's consider that volume. So consider a volume V. It's always called V, isn't it? Right, with a surface around it. Right? Surrounded by S, not surprisingly. Right? 
So let's draw my arbitrarily shaped volume. There it is. Label S and V, the, the, the volume and the surface. And of course, we're going to think about a little surface, a little piece of that surface. And I'm going to think about the current density that may be passing through that little piece of the surface with respect to the normal to that little piece of surface where the area and the direction is described by the little ds term as you're familiar with. Okay. So the first thing we can say is the net enclosed charge the net enclosed charge at any given instant in that volume just count it up, call it big Q integral of the charge density so far so easy. That's one thing I can say. Another thing I can say is, of course, the current is a flow of charge. So the flow of charge through the surface S, flow of charge through S, when I, if I look at it over the whole surface, that's got to be equal to, obviously, the integral over the surface of J dot dS. Okay? Now, obviously, if there is charge leaving the volume, the amount of charge in the volume must be going down. So I can relate those two things together. Okay. So therefore, dq by dt, the, the rate at which the charge in the volume is changing, well, that's obviously d by dt of integral over v of rho dv. That's what the charge inside is doing. Right. So we're not making any statements about what individual points rho are doing within the volume. It's just what, what the whole thing is doing. That must be equal and opposite to the amount of current flowing through the surface, J dot dS, obviously. Right? So those two right-hand terms must sum to zero. Right? Pretty boring so far, but it'll get better. So what we're going to do is... You'll have to sort of remember which of these to apply in which situation. Right? But we're going to apply various tools, right? either Maxwell's equations or other mathematical formalisms that we know. So here we're going to try using the divergence theorem. So let's try using that. So can use the divergence theorem to do something interesting. Well, the divergence theorem allows it to relate the properties of a vector field passing through a surface, so you've got the yes there, okay, to the divergence of the current density within a volume that is enclosed by that surface. Okay. So again, I can't remember when you last looked at that, but you have covered it. Okay. <coughs> now, <coughs> because we can do that, that's just the right-hand term of the equation above, I can now say, I can now relate that right-hand term, okay, del dot j dv, is equal to the integral. Well, you can see. Let's let's take that term there. And you can see it's the rate of change of the integral of the charge density over the volume. Right. But if the volume itself is not changing, I can swap that around. So I could write that term as d rho by dt dv. I've just put the d by dt on the inside. And that's similarly an integral over the volume. Now, if that's true over a volume v, it can be true over an infinitesimal volume, which means I can remove the integrals, which means I can now write del dot j plus d rho by dt equals zero, and this is the continuity equation. So what it's basically saying is it's relating the current to the rate of change of charge at any given location, which is sort of obvious, but it's nice to write it down clearly. Okay. Let's do it one more time. This time with feeling. Let's do it from Ampere's law. Okay. Well, Ampere and Gauss's law. So what we'll do is we'll do del cross b. So this is Ampere's law. So we'll get used to writing these down regularly. Mu naught, epsilon naught, e by dt. That's a full Ampere's law. 
And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the divergence of Ampere's law. So I'm going to multiply every term, left and right, uh, well, not multiply, but I do del dot every term. Okay, so I'll do del dot, del, del cross B, so it's left hand term, mu naught, del dot J, okay? And then mu naught, epsilon naught, del dot DE by DT. Okay, so I'll just put in brackets, I did del dot that, del dot equation above. Okay, so that was out here. I'm not quite sure what's supposed to put. Graph accent or no accent? I think it's a graph accent, isn't it? We anyway, know it's out Okay, so we know that this left-hand term here—that's a vector identity, that's zero. Okay, and because of that, we can now cancel out mu zero on the right on the two right-hand terms. That's neat. Okay, what can I do with that? Well, I can remark that this term here, del dot del, so del dot del e by dt, I can apply Gauss's law. Del dot E equals rho over epsilon zero. Okay, Gauss's law. And I can do the same trick where I pop the del inside, d d by dt, so I can write epsilon zero del dot d e by dt. That's that right hand term from up there, coming down there. And I can write that down as epsilon zero d by dt del dot e. Okay. And now I can relate it directly to the to Gauss's law, which is epsilon zero over epsilon zero d rho by dt. Okay, so I've taken that right-hand term. So now, of course, those two epsilons cancel out. So straight away, I can. So I've taken this term. Okay, I applied Gauss's law to get to relate that term to d rho by dt, and now that d rho by dt, which is the replacement of this term, is equal to del dot j. So now I can say that the left hand side is zero, which is, equal, which is equal to del dot j plus d rho by dt. So the continuity equation again. All right. So that's just a little bit of, a little bit of uh, manipulation to prove an important result we'll use later. All right. Okay, so far. Yeah. We'll follow again, okay. All right. Potentials. We have previously covered the potential due to an electric field. We're now going to look at potentials due to magnetic fields. But we're going to start by revisiting potentials for electric fields. Okay. So another new section. Potentials in electromagnetism. So like I said, I'm going through all this at a fairly brisk pace because most of it's familiar with you, but it's good to just go through it, get ourselves familiarized with the material we're covering, which will be useful later. And that's what that continuity equation derivation is going to be used for. We can use it later on. So, potentials in electromagnetism. We're going to start by thinking of static potentials. So we can think of the static case first, and then we'll look at dynamic potentials because they're way more interesting. So in our static case, we're going to start by reminding ourselves what we mean by a potential. And in the static potential situation, we're saying there's no variation with time, so any d del by del t terms disappear. Okay. Now if we remark back up to Maxwell's equations, because all the del by del t terms are zero, so we can then say that del cross e equals zero, okay? Faraday's law. If the curl of some vector field is equal to zero, we know that that is a conservative field. Okay? I think you covered that idea before. So the, if a curl of a vector field is equal to zero, we can therefore write the electric field in terms of a scalar field. Okay? So the vector field can be written in terms of a scalar field, phi, which we label the potential, and it's the gradient of that potential. Okay? Because we can write that, 
we can then define a potential in any given location R, right? Because all, all of these, of course, are functions of some position in three-dimensional space. And this is our logical process. Our statement is, in the static case, there's no variation of time, therefore the kernel of the electric field is zero, therefore we can write it in terms of a potential, which means we can define the potential as some value with respect to some other location, okay, those can be vector quantities, by following along the electric field along the path between those two locations. So R0 is clearly a reference location. There is no absolute value. There's no correct value of the potential. Right? I always have to define it in terms of some reference. And we conventionally define that reference as being far away and the potential at that location is equal to zero. Okay, that's how we conventionally do it. But we don't have to do it that way. So in any calculation, any physical calculation that we do, right, we should be able to replace phi with some value plus a constant, itself plus a constant, and any electric field, remember the electric field is the measurable thing, that's the thing we can put a meter in and get it, the potential can't be measured, we can only measure the change in the potential, which is equivalent to saying how the electric field varied as we went over some path. So, we should be able to change in any of our calculations the potential value and still get the same electric field. Now, because in the static case, so remember this is the static case, we can write E equals minus del phi. Okay. Because it's a static case, we can write the electric field in terms of the potential, and now we can substitute into Gauss's law. Okay. Which allows us to write del dot del phi, so we've replaced the electric field with the potential. And now we can relate the potential to the charge density. Obviously, del dot del phi can be rewritten as del squared phi okay, is equal to minus rho over epsilon zero. Okay. So I will occasionally box these equations. I'll try to remember to box them all, but they should all be fairly well labelled again in the notes if I forget to do that. That's an important equation because it allows us to take a series of charges which are located at various places in space and from them derive a potential remembering that there is a constant that I can add and subtract to the overall potential. Okay. So one simple solution that you've already seen for Poisson's equation is that for a point charge, and we'll see others later, which is that the potential caused by a point charge is equal to Q over 4 pi epsilon naught r, which you've seen before. Now, you can generalize that statement of the potential caused by a point charge of a, of a finite amount, and you can think about deriving, and this is where we'll, this is where we'll get more interesting later, here is some volume, again, and we have to write things down a bit carefully here, right? So we're thinking about what is the potential at some point over there, right? So with respect to some origin over here. So I'm gonna draw that vector carefully so we know what we're talking about. That is the vector R, that's the position at which we're saying this is the potential at this location. And I'm gonna to try to relate that to the charge density which happens to be at that location within some larger body of charge. So this is a body of charge that has some volume. I'm going to call it V primed, okay? Because I'm going to call the charge density as a function of R primed, okay? To distinguish it from R where I'm looking at the resultant potential, okay? 
So there's a little piece of charge. So rather than Q up here, I'm going to talk about this, say Q, in this infinitesimal piece of charge. I'm going to call it rho d v prime. Okay? So I'm saying there's a little piece of charge at r prime, and I'm asking what is the potential at this point r due to the little piece of charge over there. And obviously you can see that it must be proportional to that distance there, the separation, because it's 1 over that separation. So there has to be an r minus r prime that appears in our formula. And just like that simple situation here, I can simply add up all those little pieces. So I can say if I have a, so put them 1 over 4 pi epsilon and 0 left there, I can take all the little pieces, okay, and I count up the little pieces which are in this volume V prime, just to remind myself that it's, it's not, you know, that, that R is not the same thing as R prime. So I'm counting up all the little R primes, and I need to scale them by mod R minus R primed, okay, and I'm integrating over V prime. So that's the more general statement for a system of charges, what the static potential is. This is a static potential. Okay. So that's, that's to whet your appetite. Have a little break from anybody when you catch your breath. Any questions so far? Am I retaining your interest? I know this, this, we have to go through this bit to get to the cooler stuff later, okay? Right. So just be aware of that. And I, I know this, you've seen this stuff before, but it's good to remind yourself of half an hour. Right? Okay. So, static potentials, electric fields, all fairly straightforward. Let's jump into magnetic fields. So, let's look at the magnetic field case. Of course, magnetic fields are different. They'll have extra things going on. Right? The problem with magnetic fields is, we're going to immediately start with a bit of a conundrum. We saw before that in the electrostatic case that we could write down E equals minus del phi, where del was some was where phi was some kind of potential. Right? So let's just try doing that in a very naive way. I'm going to start with a similar statement. Again, this is if in a static case to start with. I'm going to start with a statement that the magnetic field can similarly be defined in terms of a potential. Okay? So this is a scalar vector field phi. So obviously this phi is not the same as that phi, right? Okay. I'm going to start with a scalar field phi, and then see, is it possible to define a magnetic field in terms of that potential phi? Right? Because of that statement, we therefore know that del cross B equals zero. That is a consequence of that statement, right? Those two statements are equivalent. But that's no good, is it? Because we, we, we know something about magnetic fields. We know that there are static situations, okay, so in which the magnetic field at a particular location, at least it's curl, is defined by the current. Right? So a current flowing is still a static case. But it's very important to bear that in mind. Okay, so a steady current, the charges are moving from place to place. Right? So you can imagine, say, a loop of current. We'll be talking about loops of current quite a lot. Imagine a loop of current with charges going round and round in a circle. <coughs> Over time, the charge density at any location is not changing. And the current density at any location is not changing. And it's not changing anywhere else. So everything, th th there's, there's no change to the function of time. So this is allowable in a static case. We can have steady currents, and the charges are still not moving in any net form, right? That's a very important statement to bear in mind. So it's entirely possible in a static case to have a finite curl of the electric field if there is a current. So clearly, that statement there can't be true, so that's no good. So therefore, this statement can't be true, but that's no good. Okay. So that's our contradiction. The magnetic field cannot be defined in terms of a scalar field in three dimensions phi, our, our, our supposed potential. So we can't do the same thing we did for electric fields. Can we do something else? Obviously yes, let's do that. Right? So let's start by remarking about something we know about vector fields in general. See, however, so this is no good. However, 
let's try a vector identity. So remember what I said, we're going to try different, different mathematical tools. The trick is knowing which ones to use, right, obviously. So let's use a vector identity. And I'm going to choose del dot del cross a equals zero. So that is true for any vector field A. It's not very well written, is it? The older I get, the more clumsy I get. I was, I was great as an undergraduate, very neat, but nothing more. Don't know what you're like. Anyway, um, so for any vector field, I can make the statement that del dot del cross A equals zero. Okay. But we want to know that del dot B equals zero. That was our no magnetic monopoles law. And that, that suggests something, doesn't it? Why don't we write B equals del cross A? Okay, so I, I happen to choose the letter A. Well, it's quite close to B, isn't it? But it's, it's also the one that people, uh, people tend to use. We're going to call this the magnetic vector potential. Okay. I'm going to see why in a second. Because it turns out it has behaviours which are analogous to what we saw in the electric field potential. So we're going to posit that we can write down the magnetic field as being the result of taking the curl of some other function. And where we're going with this is we're going to ask ourselves, is it possible to define what A is in terms of current? So remember, we defined phi in terms of charges, and then phi lets us get the electric field. What we're doing here, we're going to try to define A in terms of currents, and from that, use A to get the magnetic field. Okay? And you've already got the magnetic field for certain situations from currents directly. We're going to see that doing it in terms of, of the vector potential is way easier. But we have to understand what a, how A works first. Okay? So, for this, again, this is all for the static case. We'll do, we'll do dynamic stuff later. For the static case, we can write Ampere's law. So we're just going to simple-mindedly substitute in, so we're going to write del cross B. Well, that's going to become del cross del cross A. And that's equal to mu naught J, because if it's a static case, there is no varying electric field. Okay. But we can write this term here. Right? There is another vector identity. So this becomes del cross del cross A, that term can be rewritten as del, del dot a minus del squared a. Okay. That's looking a little bit closer, isn't it? Because in Poisson's equation that we saw before, there was a del squared term, wasn't there? Right. So we're going to do something a bit cheeky. I'm just going to say, I'm going to just choose del dot a equals zero. Okay. Without any justification yet. We'll see it doesn't matter later. So I'm going to choose that. Okay. I'm going to see in a bit that that is equivalent to choosing some arbitrary potential reference. Right. So this is a gauge. Okay. It, it, does, it, you know, it, it doesn't change the physical measurables. We are allowed to choose it. And it's known as the Coulomb gauge, which should be the name of a dubstep group. But, but apparently it isn't. I have looked and tried to buy their albums, but they're not there. Um, Okay, so what are we saying? We're saying that choosing this, we've, ch we've chosen del dot a equals zero is, is similar in nature to choosing phi equals zero at some reference point conventionally taken to be at infinity. there are many, many functions, you know, there are, there are many possible functions, A, that can satisfy del cross A equals B. Right? We're just choosing the one which allows us to calculate A most conveniently, I mean, clearly dropping del dot A and making it zero is pretty convenient. Right? And remember that all we do, the only reason we're defining the magnetic vector potential is so that we can obtain real magnetic fields and understand them better. So what we've done, we've simply dropped that term. Let's just bring it back up again. There it is. Okay, so we've dropped that term. 
So now we can write del squared a, which started to look more like a potential. So we can rewrite del cross b as minus del squared a. And that's equal to mu naught j. Okay? Again, that's a static case of Ampere's law, so there's no electric field variation. So let's rewrite that. And it looks very much like Poisson's equation. We write del squared a equals minus mu naught j. Super duper. So we have a pair of equations. You should really write them the other way up. Somehow the electric field seems to be, you want to write that down first, don't you? But there we are, I've written it the other way up. Maybe you know it's can write them the other way up to that. So now we have a pair of equations that have a lovely symmetry. Right? They're saying the rate of generation of these potentials, sorry, the, the generation of these potentials at any locations can be derived in terms of the potentials and currents at a variety of locations. We need to look a little bit more carefully. This one's fairly straightforward to understand. Let's look a little bit more carefully at that first one, the magnetic potential. What does it actually mean? Well, when we take del squared, let's look at the A component of that. So, del, so remember, the, the vector potential is AX, AY, and AZ. So let's look, a, look at the AX term. Del squared AX can be written equivalently. Okay, if we write that as, as its components, it's del squared AX by dx squared plus del squared AY x by dy squared yeah, plus del squared ax by dz squared. And of course, there's, there's two other equations for what's happening in the y and z directions. And that's equal to mu naught jx. So notice all, the, all those uh, vector terms have gone away because we're looking at one component. And what that's telling me is, is that the current flowing in a particular direction is determining the vector field in that direction. That's the usefulness of it. So it allows us to, 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 to write, to observe symmetries and see other things in a much more convenient way than we can do with a magnetic field. So therefore, we can write down three extra equations. We can write down for each of those three components, remember there's one for x, one for y, one for z, as this is entirely uh, equivalent to what we had for the scalar potential for the electric field. If we imagine a region V primed within which there are currents flowing, like a cable for example, I can calculate the vector potential at some location far away by integrating over V primed and I just apply that scaling factor. Okay? So that's one of the components. Right? So what I can do now is I can write down the whole definition of the vector potential. Well, is mu naught over 4 pi. I'm simply lumping together each of those three components of the uh, of the current into one vector term, and then I'm just integrating over the volume. And again, all of this is true for that static situation. So, if the currents are static, then this all all of this is true. So what? Well, just to finish off, we'll show an example of how we can use this definition of the vector potential to obtain a, a, a classic result. Right? We're going to take the curl of the vector potential, which obviously is a magnetic field. Right? So if I so well, let's recap, right? and then we're going to finish off when we've done that. If I know what the currents are doing in my static situation, those are the J values, and they are present over some volume V, I can add up all, I, all of those currents, and I can uh, calculate the, a, a vector potential A at some location due to those currents with, with the correct distance scaling. That's what that denominator is. But of course, we know that the magnetic field B is simply the curl of A. That's how we've defined it. So if I take the curl of that vector potential, which is probably quite conveniently obtained in many situations. I can then directly obtain the magnetic field, and that's our two-step process. We find the vector potential, and then we find the magnetic field. So I can just write that down, simple mindedly, that the same, same equation one more time. Okay. Mod R minus mod R primed. Okay. There's one extra step we need to do because we have 
this is a bit complicated here, isn't it? So let's remark that I have, if I have a, a scalar and a vector function, f and u, okay, and I want to take the curl of it, I can rewrite that, this is another one of our, of our identities, I can write that as del cross u times f minus u cross del f. How are we going to use that? Well, let's let's make that specific. Right? I'm going to write down f as being 1 over mod r minus r prime. Okay? So we're saying this is f down here. That's my scalar part of that, that uh, product. And I'm going to write u as equal to j of r prime. Okay? So now I can write b as del plus a as equal to f del Plus, I don't mix it up. So f should be taken as being one over r minus r prime, del cross j prime, okay, minus j of r prime cross with del f, okay. Right. Now that term there, del of f, is r minus r prime over mod r minus mod r prime. Cubed. Okay. So that's one over r squared, isn't it? That bit there. Okay. Let's draw that with a little arrow. And the curl of the currents can be cancelled out. Okay. From that, we can write b equals u naught over four pi. That's that first term we had before. And we can now write it as j. R prime, just writing all these things out carefully. R minus R primed over R minus R primed cubed. Okay, so what have we done? We've defined the vector potential in terms of currents. We've taken the curl of it in order to get the magnetic field. We've done a little bit of mathematical jiggery pokery to rewrite that. And this that we've obtained at the end, it says if I have a set of currents. I can calculate the magnetic field at some distance, and you can see a 1 over r squared has appeared. Okay? There's a cross term there to indicate the directions of, those magnetic, of the magnetic field with respect to the currents, and that's just the bio sabot law. Okay. So that's an example, quite, quite a useful one I think, of, of defining the magnetic vector potential and using it to obtain the magnetic field. So I think that's all for today. On Monday, we're going to um, summarize that, and then we'll go on to looking at the dynamic potential case. When things will hot up a bit. Okay. So like I said, any questions, uh, you won't find me, well, not today, in the nuclear lab, but from next week, you'll find me in the nuclear lab, and you can have a chat now as well. All right, see you next week. See you Monday. <coughs> You're absolutely right. It's here, and I will summarise that. I, I couldn't quite recall it, and I realised time was running out. But I will. I will. I just thought it was something. I just looked down. Yeah. The list. <laughs> it's one of those small terms, and I will check that, and I will make sure that I mention it very clearly in the interviews. It's this term here, isn't it? I need to check that, and I will. I will make sure I clarify that at the next lecture. You're right to bring it up. Okay. Cheers. <laughs> <clears throat>
Yes, there should be. Did I not put it in? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it is in the notes and I just forgot to write it down. You're absolutely right. I shall make sure I've noted that as well. Uh, okay. Hmm? It's DV primed, yeah, in the way that I've written it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. so I could run over a bit, but uh, not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's all yours, yeah, all my stuff. Yeah. All right, thank you.